Hello maths fans, welcome to another video and I'm really excited today to be joined by a special guest. This is Michael Penn. Thanks for having me, I'm really excited to be on the channel today. So Michael has just finished teaching me all about Lie algebras. If you haven't yet seen this video, do go and watch it because it's going to form part one of this two part special and that one is over on Michael's channel. So we talked all about Lie algebras and we finished with briefly touching on uh, something to do with Heisenberg. And I was really excited to see this because I, what I'm planning to, to teach you today, Michael, is going to be a mathematical derivation of Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. Now I chose this topic because I believe you previously studied physics as an undergraduate, is that correct? Yeah, I did study physics a bit. Okay, so hopefully you will appreciate the, the sort of bringing in some of this maths uh, to, to the physics setting. And this is actually based on um, a part of the quantum course that I teach to my second year students um, here in Oxford. Fantastic. So we're going to start in hopefully a very familiar place, which is just going to be Schrodinger's equation. Um, so when we're studying sort of quantum systems, quantum particles and whatnot, we um, look at Schrodinger's equation, which tells us the following, um, i h bar times d psi by dt is going to be equal to, I always get this sign wrong, minus h bar squared over 2m. Then we have the Laplacian of psi, and then we're going to have our potential v, which is a function of position times psi. So we've got a time derivative, we've got a spatial derivative in the form of the Laplacian, so all of the second order spatial derivatives in however many dimensions, um, and then we have our potential, which is just going to be a function of position. I hope this is familiar. Does this ring any bells? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I vaguely okay. remember learning about this many years ago. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, so our starting point is, oh, we're interested in solving this. So we're going to be given a specific potential V, which, which could be anything. A common example we, we first study would be, for example, the, the harmonic oscillator. Um, but you know, we're given some kind of potential that's going to control the, the behavior of our particle. And we're interested in solving for psi, which is going to be our wave function. Now, the, the first sort of step to this is actually to use a technique, um, we're going to gloss over the details, but called separation of variables. And basically, what we're going to do, or what we do, is we make an assumption that the wave function psi can actually be split up. So it's a function of position and time. And the separation of variables approach just says, well, let's suppose we have some function of position, which we call lowercase psi, and that's just function of position multiplied by a function of time. And then if we substitute that in and we kind of do some rearranging and we can actually solve for the time dependence, and we say this is equal to e to the minus i e t, and then I think, yeah, we also divide by h bar. So, Anyone who's done sort of a, an introductory PDEs course, um, this is one of the first techniques you use to try and solve a partial differential equation. You substitute in, supposing that you can break your function up into this position and the time separately, and then you solve for each bit by itself. So when you solve the time one, that turns out to be quite easy. You get this function. But what we're going to do is just substitute this in and then see what we're left with. So. Hopefully, um, you can help me out with this. So if I'm just going to substitute this function into my equation, so I'm going to have i h bar, and then I want the time derivative. So what will I get if I do the time derivative of this function here? Uh, so you'll get the same function multiplied by minus i e over h bar. Perfect. Um, h bar. And then, as you say, we're going to get the minus i e over h bar. So minus, I mean, I squared, so that just all becomes a plus, and I think we then get e and then over h bar, don't we? Good, right. Uh, so obviously those are going to cancel as well. Um, and then on the right hand side, we're then going to get minus h bar squared over 2m. <clears throat> and then of course, this is just going to act on the spatial part. 
and we can just sort of pull out the time dependency. So right. we can write out the exponential term, e t over h bar, and then we've got grad squared psi, and then similarly on the n plus v, we've got the psi and we've got e to the whatever. I'm not going to bother to write out. Because now we can simplify this quite um, considerably. Right, like we could cancel out the exponential parts or just like remove the exponential parts. Exactly, so they're just going to all disappear. Um, and then we're just going to be left with um, e times psi uh, is equal to uh, minus h bar squared over 2m plus squared of psi uh, plus v of psi. And this is going to be our stationary state Schrodinger equation. And this is the one, uh, particularly in the maths course that I teach, we basically just kind of concentrate on this. We just kind of ignore the time dependence and just say, right, this is the thing where the interesting behavior is going to happen. Yeah, so yeah, this yeah, is yeah. what we're going to look at. Um, okay. So that's stationary. And so like, do you interpret this E psi on the left as like, Energy time, energy exactly. of the wave function. Yeah, yeah. Exactly, so you've got some yes. sort of eigenvector eigenvalue relationship. Exactly. Yeah. So because the the next step then is just to basically define the operator on the right hand side exactly as you can see it coming. We just call this. This is something acting on psi. So we just call it um, h for the Hamiltonian and say h of psi is equal to energy times psi. So this is now going to be an eigenvalue. This is an eigenfunction. And we've got our Hamiltonian, which is our operator. Great. So, and that's where the energy of these various systems are just literally the eigenvalues of a particular Hamiltonian. And the Hamiltonian is going to be determined by whatever potential you're interested in. So the spatial derivative, you're always going to have the Laplacian and then it's just V can change. Right. And that'll give you slightly different eigenvalue, eigenvector equations to solve, leading to different wave functions. Okay. So we're not actually going to go through the eigenvalue and eigenvector bits, because that's kind of what we spend most of the course doing, but we don't need to do that for Heisenberg. I would imagine that would be days long. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> that is, that's a whole, that's literally like 14 of the 16 lectures, uh, yeah. more or less. So, but I wanted to get us to this point because this is, um, and sort of is helpful and is going to be useful for where we're going next. I think it motivates the definitions and the things we're going to talk about. That's the idea. Now, what we're going to do uh, for the next step is actually sort of break H up into smaller pieces by defining some operators. Um, so we're going to have an operator x, which is the position operator, um, and that's simply going, it's going to be three-dimensional, x1, x2, x3, that should be a round bracket, uh, and this is position. And this one's very straightforward, it just multiplies your wave function. So if I had um, xj applied to psi, that is just the same as multiplying by that coordinate, of your wave function. Right. Then we have the momentum operator, P, which again we have P1, P2, and P3 for the three dimensions, uh, and this one's momentum. And this is actually going to involve a derivative. So if I do Pj applied to psi, this is going to be equal to minus I h bar d psi by dx j. So for example, if I were to take j to be 1, I'm going to be doing minus i h bar d psi by dx. Or right. x1, but the x direction. Now obviously x2 is y and x3 is z. We often interchange between them, <laughs> particularly in the lecture notes, <laughs> just to confuse people. Um, so we've got these two operators. Now, if we were to calculate, and again, if you can help me out with this, if I was to calculate uh, p1 squared plus p2 squared plus p3 squared, um, what would that be as an operator? Uh, that would be the first bit of h. It would indeed 
be, well, more or less the first bit of H. <laughs> We've got like a constant of the 2M. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. up to uh, a constant. Floating around. So if we put the 1 over 2M here, yeah. then it becomes exactly minus H bar squared over 2M times squared squared. Whoops, headphone <laughs> down. Okay, what we can do, or the idea is, we have this Hamiltonian H, which is gonna give us our energy eigenvalues and our wave functions. And we can actually rewrite it in terms of P and X. And the X part just comes in with depending on what V is. Because V up here, remember, is just a function of position. Right. So, you know, we can just say, well, V therefore is a function of the X, J operators, whatever they may be. In some right, 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 right. Kind of combination. So the key thing is these operators P and X, position and momentum, the motivation for why we consider them and why they're important are because a combination of them will always give you your Hamiltonian, i.e. gives you Schrodinger's equation, gives you, tells you what's happening in these quantum systems. So that's kind of why we're interested in P and X. And now, once we've got these definitions, what we're gonna do is move over to the algebra side of it, figure out some commutators involving P and X, and then do some clever stuff involving expectation and uh, variance. Now we're going to define um, the expectation of an operator. Uh, and to do this, we need to think about uh, inner products. So we have an inner product where if we have two wave functions, psi and phi, then we just say, well, that's the integral of the conjugate of the first one times the second one. Uh, and that'll be over all space. So we have a way of defining uh, our inner product, and I think it's going to be a uh, complex inner product because we take the conjugate of that first one. Right. And we use this to define the expectation. So the expectation of an operator, um, let's call it A, is defined as E psi of A. So you calculate the expected value of your operator given a certain wave function. And all you're going to do is take the inner product of your wave function with a psi, and then we normalize as well, like so. Okay. So hopefully it sort of possibly fits with how you would think about expectation in a probability setting. Yeah, 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 yeah. If you're working with a continuous random variable, you know, your, your expectation is x times the PDF integrated, kind of saying, you know, this is like, multiplying your wave function by a, which is the thing you're interested in the expectation of, and then For sure. the integral. Yeah. Um, so this is going to be the expectation. Um, and then we also define um, what's called the dispersion. Uh, and this is basically the standard deviation. So you can, of course, think of the standard deviation or the variance, the standard deviation squared. You can write that in terms of expectations. And so that's exactly what we're going to do here, because given we have a definition for expectation, we can then just use that now to define the standard deviation, the variance. Well, as I said, the dispersion here is basically the standard deviation. It just has a different name. So the formula looks like what you would expect, right? So we have, we use a um, capital delta um, psi of A. So defining it in terms of the expectation, we do the expectation of the thing squared um, minus the expectation all squared. And then, because it's the standard deviation as opposed to the variance, the square root at the end. Right. Given all of this, we can now finally compute uh, a commutator. Uh, and then we put it all together. We're going to define a commutator of two um, operators to simply be a b minus b a and again this will obviously satisfy your Lie algebra and everything else that we were just been talking about where clearly if you swap the order you get a minus and all of those other properties will follow right so what we want to do is calculate uh, let's do which way around did I do this p i with x j Okay, 
And this reminded me a lot of your discussion at the end about the, the Heisenberg uh, <laughs> Lie algebra. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's very similar. This was the bit when I... Yeah. Like, this is so similar. This is awesome. Um, so, if we just simply compute that, so we're going to get pi xj minus um, xj pi. Oh, and let's apply, sorry, let's just apply this to psi just to help us out figuring out what's happening. This is, tends to be how I would compute what's happening just to be sure of it. Oh, for sure, for sure. You've got to apply it to something to have a feel for it. Yes. Yeah. So let's see, the, the, X, the xj pi, that'll be just like uh, xj times d psi d x i. Yeah. Up and to a constant. I forget, there's like an i h bar in front of everything. Yes. It's gonna yeah, be yeah. But we can pull that out of the whole thing. Yeah. Or do that, yeah. <laughs> and then the first one, then we need the minus i h bar, and then we've got to take the derivative, again, very similar to what we've seen with the Lie algebras, of xj times um, psi, isn't it now? Right, right, right. And you have to you have to remember that you have to use the product rule there. There's like some kind of subtle yes. composition of those two operators happening. Exactly. So now... Yeah, like if you write the parentheses wrong, you, you're hosed. Yes. <laughs> 100%. Um, so now we can see... Um, so I think possibly the easiest way to do it is to say, let's suppose that uh, what if i does not equal j? Right, because there's going to be, there's different behavior here happening. So we've kind of got case one. Yeah. If i does not equal j, then this derivative with respect to xi, it doesn't really care about the xj. So yeah, that's right. It's not a true product rule, is it? So then it doesn't matter. You just put that out, and they're just going to cancel, and you're going right. to get zero. But then the more interesting case, then, is when i does equal j, because as we've, saw, we've seen with the Lie algebras, now we've got d by dxj of xj times psi, so we're going to have to do the product rule. Right. So when we do that, we're going to get the minus i h bar xj d psi i dxj. Um, and then, so that was ignoring the xj, and then I can, of course, hit the xj and get minus i h bar um, times psi, and then plus i h bar d psi by dx. So is the operator, so is the difference, the physical interpretation of the difference like PI and XJ measuring position first or measuring momentum first? Um, that's certainly one way to think about it, yes. So yeah, would like X, XJ PI Psi, would that like measure the momentum of psi first and then yeah you're kind of position. like yeah you're acting and yeah you're doing the momentum first and then interested in the position yeah yeah i think that's a nice way to think about it and then the other way around you're like measuring the position first and then measuring the momentum got it got it got it yeah yeah i think that's a nice way to think about it yeah so these two are going to cancel um and then we're going to be left with minus i h bar times psi so if we tidy all of that up, the sort of conclusion is pi xj as an operator just acts as minus i h bar at delta ij times the identity. Right. So you just simply get a constant difference between these two um, operators. The final step is going to be to prove a result involving uh, a certain commutator or a certain uh, property of a commutator that's going to allow us to then um, derive something about expectations and then do some clever stuff with quadratics at the end. And suddenly Heisenberg's uncertainty principle pops out because <laughs> we haven't even begun to talk about that yet. It's, it's all kind of in the, the knitting together of these various different definitions and pieces and it all just kind of suddenly falls out when you just compute a certain proposition. So that's what we're going to do. If we have operators A, B, C, uh, such that the commutator of A and B equals I times C. So this is, even though we're going to apply it to a specific case to get Heisenberg, 
it is true in much more general case for different operators. Um, these are also going to be um, self-adjoint. Now, it's not super important, but basically what that means is um, when we do the inner product and we had, say, psi a psi, we can actually um, take... Like move it across. Move it across and take the adjoint like that, yeah. Um, so what this tells you them to be self-adjoint is that A is A star. Right. But we don't need to worry too much about that. That's just, it is a sort of important subtlety of, <laughs> of requiring the, the calculation. Um, so if we just have this, three self-adjoint operators, such that they have this commutator, then we can show, and this is what we're going to prove, that if we take the norm of A minus I T B of psi, if we take the norm squared, then that's going to be equal to the expected value of A squared plus T times the expected value of C and then plus T squared times the expected value of B squared. So this is what we want to prove, uh, and this is true for um, for real t. And we're going to make it all easy easier for ourselves and say psi is normalized. Okay. So the end product with itself is one. So just makes the expectations a bit easier to calculate. Sure, sure, sure. So this is our proposition. Um, we're going to go quickly, well, go through the proof in just a moment. But the key thing, of course, being that you can hopefully see where we're going in the sense that we actually have this relationship up here where we pick A, B, and C to sort of be appropriate operators and we can kind of see where perhaps A and B are going to you know, come into the problem and then suddenly you're talking about something involving uh, expectations of momentum and position, which is hopefully pushing us in the direction of Heisenberg. Right. So the first step is going to be to calculate um, what is A minus I T B star times A minus I T B. Right. So the star means to take the adjoint or to take the complex conjugate if you just have a simple uh, complex number. Right. So that first one will just simply be, because everything's self-adjoint, that's going to become A plus I T B times A minus I T B. Okay, so if we were to now expand that, what will I get? Uh, you'll get a squared plus t squared b squared. Ah, now, <laughs> absolutely true, but we worry about commutators, don't we? Oh, uh, yeah, 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 so we'll get like... So we have to be careful. Yeah. So we have to actually sort of go through and do all four terms. But this is good, because we wanted the commutator to appear. Oh, so you'll get a squared plus t commutator a, b or something. Yeah, so get AB, and then if I was to put the minus in here, BA, I think that's right, and then we're going to get B minus plus T squared B squared. Right. <laughs> so then we spot that um, this is, of course, equals AB, but we've said that we have this relationship that says that's I times C. Right. So then uh, minus I squared becomes a plus, so in all in all, we get a squared plus TC plus T squared B squared. Uh, it's already starting to look a bit more like what we want up here. Right. We've just got to do that expectation. But for that, we simply just calculate, well, what is this actual norm? Um, so when you take the norm of something, you take the inner product with itself. Um, so when we do this, norm squared, that's just the inner product of a minus ITB psi with a minus ITB psi. And then we can take this one across. Yeah, 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 yeah. So with a squared plus TC plus T squared B squared applied to psi. And then since everything's normalized, oh, this is exactly our definition of the expectation of this thing. Right. So that's just E psi, the expected value of psi, 
under this operator, a squared plus tc plus t squared. Yeah, and then the expectation is like linear or something, right? Exactly, yes. Expectation is still going to be linear as it is in probability. So that's then e psi of a squared plus t. And of course the t comes out because it's a constant, so. Yep. And then plus t squared. Right, so that proves our proposition. So now we've proven our proposition, what we're going to do is actually note that this is positive because it's the norm of something squared. It's clearly a very positive thing. Right. It's very similar equal to zero. So therefore, if we now treat this, this is a quadratic in T. Right. So if I have a quadratic in T that is greater than or equal to zero, what can we conclude? about that quadratic, about one of its properties, maybe? Uh, like, the, the discriminant is negative? Yes. The discriminant, yeah. yeah the discriminant because there are no real roots. Exactly, there are no real roots. Yeah. So we now can conclude, therefore, that the discriminant is negative. Uh, and so for this, again, where t is our variable, so b squared, going to give us the expected value of c squared, mm -hmm. um, b squared minus 4 times a, which is the expected value of b squared, and then times c, which is our constant term, is negative. That means that it's bigger. Uh, and what we're going to do is just take that 4 over here, like so. Now, the final step here is now just to pick an appropriate a, b, and c. Or pick an appropriate a and b, and then c, of course, is fixed by this yeah, relationship. Yeah. So it, it almost works if you take um, a and b to just be um, x and p, sort of our position of momentum operators. You get very close, but if you think about what Heisenberg's uncertainty principle says, it's to do with the sort of, I think of it as it says, the, um, the accuracy of your measurement. Mm -hmm. So like when you make a measurement, the accuracy of it in some sense or the error is basically given by the variance. That's one way of interpreting what's happening sort of from a statistics or probability, sure, probabilistic sure, sure, sure. point of view. So what we really need is if we can make this, we kind of need this to become um, the variance in position or momentum and this to become the variance in position or momentum and then we will have Heisenberg's and right. principle. So what you have to pick is if we let A be equal to um, X minus the expected value of X, and we let B be equal to P minus the expected value of P. Then we just need to double check now what our commutator is. Um, so commutator of A and B is going to be AB minus BA. So then if we plug in what these are, that's X minus expected value. And of course the expected values here are just treated like constants um, times P minus E P. Uh, minus p minus e p times x minus x. Now you can expand this out <clears throat> um, and basically the sort of swapping around the, the expectations here behave like constants. So interchanging them, they are going to commute. So there's no issue when you right. have an expectation multiplying an operator. So all of those terms cancel. And you're just basically left with the exact same commutator. This is just the commutator of x and p, is what this turns into, is what you're left with. Everything else cancels out. So the commutator here is just the commutator of x and p. So that's negative of what we had earlier, actually, isn't it? So then it's just i h bar times the identity operator. So now we have our c. So C here 
is exactly um, h bar times the identity operator. And we've picked what a and b are. So if we plug everything in to this result we have over here, we're simply going to have um, on the left hand side, so C is um, this, isn't it? So this is C. So the expected value of a constant times an identity operator is just the constant. So C is just playing the role of h bar, so the expected value of that is h bar. So this is h bar squared over 4, is what that just becomes. Then we've got the expected value of b squared, so that's less than or equal to. The expected value of b squared, so that's the expected value of uh, p minus expected value of p all squared multiplied by the expected value of x minus e of x all squared. Now, um, I don't know if you recognize this again from kind of statistics and probability, but you can rewrite a variance as the expected value of variable minus its own expectation. So what we've got, um, and you can kind of justify this um, because if you do, right, so if I write it as p minus e of p, if you square that, then you're going to get p squared um, minus 2 e of p times p plus e of p squared. So then if you take the expectation of that whole thing, then you've got expectation of p squared. Um, then you've got expectation of p, that's a constant. So then you've got minus two lots of e p squared right. plus another one. So you end up with minus e of p all squared which is exactly the dispersion of p uh, squared. So the final result we have down here is the dispersion of p um, multiplied by the dispersion of x, if I square root, is greater than or equal to h bar over 2. And that is Heisenberg's uncertainty principle following from algebra and statistical concepts. So it says that the uh, variance in your measurement of p multiplied by the variance in your measurement of x sort of has to always be positive. So your variance would be zero if you measured it exactly. And similarly, your variance here would be zero if you measured the position exactly. But that contradicts the fact that their product has to be greater than or equal to this non-zero, extremely small constant, but non-zero, <laughs> non-zero constant. So this is telling you that if you know the position really accurately, so this is tiny, this is huge. Right. And vice versa. So you can, if you know the position, you cannot know the momentum. If you know the momentum, you cannot know the position. Because as one of them goes small, the other one has to grow so that they're always bigger than this non-zero constant term. But of course, this is true, uh, and the result we had, it'd be this result, won't it? This result is true for any self-adjoint A and B whose commutator is equal to C. Sure, sure, sure. Or essentially equal to C, yeah. Yes, yes, with some constants, of course, yeah. Um, That's very cool. It's one of my favorite results. It's definitely my favorite result in this course. And it's one of my favorite results, I think, in all of the maths that I have the joy of teaching, just because I find that a lot of the students, they've heard of Heisenberg's Asserty Principle, because these are mathematicians. So it's sort of, it's well known enough that most people have heard of it, but don't really understand why. Right. You sort of think, that makes no sense, because in the real world, if I have a ball moving through the air, I instantaneously know its position and momentum. Like, there's no issue. Right. It's just like, cool, we know this. There are no, there's no problem here. And then you sort of say, well, in the quantum world, it doesn't work like that. You can't know them both. And that, I find, it's so counterintuitive. But then I think by going through this sort of, even though there's obviously quite a lot of things happening, and obviously I had to introduce, I'll try my best to motivate and, and introduce the definitions of what we were doing. Sure. But 
I find for mathematicians, they suddenly are like, okay, yeah, I don't understand it, but I accept it now because I've done some maths and I can right. follow. Yeah, for and sure. it tells me this is true. So it makes no less sense, but it's got to be true because the math says it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I hope you enjoyed doing a little bit of a <laughs> mathematical approach to quantum theory and it sort of, I guess, sent you back to your um, earlier days of being a physicist. Yeah, yeah, this was fantastic. And as I said, I, I really enjoyed learning about Lee Algebra. And for me, seeing that the link at the end, when, when you sort of wrote up about the, the commutator being, um, you had the delta function, wasn't it? When you got to the end and we had that delta function appearing. Because of course, that's what we had here with X and P. Yeah, yeah, and the one that I had, um, essentially, if you just restrict to like the energy one operators, yep. you get this exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right, so what I had is actually like, a, I think like a spread out version. Uh-huh, yeah. So thank you again for joining us, Michael. And as always, thank you everyone for watching. If you've enjoyed this video, please do subscribe to the channel and definitely make sure you also check out Michael's channel. It's Michael Penn. Thank you and see you soon.